previously on Salty Lass. Well, I was very annoyed with myself yesterday, um, mainly because I'd left Beverly's bag here at Crove. So the main thing is, we have got Bev's bag back, but we're now going to go through Jorah again. So this will be the third time in three days. I believe you're ticked off now. Ticked off? I'm beyond ticked off. I'm going to say rude things. <laughs> I'm probably going to say them off camera. No, we had a fishing boat. We were on our course, it came across our bows, trawling a line within about four or five boat lines of it, and then started dumping pots out. And he went round us in a curve, dumping pots out as we were transiting through with the lines floating on the surface. What the hell did he do that for? He could have come around the back of us. We're only 10 metres long. Would it have been that hard? What a complete and utter... coming across toward our port side and um, it was quite clear that we were going to have a very very close encounter uh, but too close so I checked on AIS because he was broadcasting and we would have passed within like 10 or 15 meters of each other which is way too close uh, now according to the call regs and we've double checked it we were the stand-on vessel because the stand-on vessel uh, is the one which is clear to starboard. If you've got another vessel to starboard of you, and he was on our port side, so we, we were to starboard of him, um, then you are the giveaway vessel. So he should have altered course to go round behind us. He didn't. He just kept flying on. So I increased our speed considerably. The AIS said that the separation distance had gone from 10 metres to 100 metres, so I was satisfied I wasn't rushing into a collision quicker, and I was going to miss it. And I also stood by ready to change course radically if I had to. Um, you could say, well, why didn't you just radically change course anyway? Well, the thing is, call regs are meant to be, they're meant to give predictability so that when you're on a yacht, you've got a fair idea what another boat is going to do. But it's the second time in an hour we've had two boats approach us. We've been on their starboard side. They've tried to cut across the front of us. One was dumping fishing pots on us, for heaven's sake. And the other didn't go astern of us. So we've had to judge two controversies uh, two contraventions of the rules now this is where it gets controversial people are going to say ah call reg says you're in the right away you just should have kept going no it doesn't call regs rule 2 i've said this before says that you're not absolved from responsibility for avoiding a collision if you can avoid it you must avoid it even if you're in the right rule 17a part 2 says same sort of thing you have a responsibility to do anything to avoid the collision even if you are the stand-on vessel. There is no right of way at sea. What there is is a set of rules that means you should be able to predict what other people are doing if they stick to the rules. What do you do when they don't? Because it happens. It happened here twice this morning. There you go. Well, we're through the hurry, but now speed's back down to a manageable nine and a half knots. <laughs> oh, we touched 11. Yeah, so what, what were we finding out about the sprickly stuff as opposed to the... The sprickly stuff that looks like it's going to slow the boat down horribly speeds it up tremendously. And the smooth stuff like this that looks like it's not going to get your way slows you down dreadfully. So we're down to nine and a half knots in this big smooth stuff and we've got a whole raft of sprickles dead ahead. So I'm expecting the speed to go through the roof in a few seconds. So uh, we're currently nine. 9.6 and we've just entered the sprickly stuff. Okay, uh, so we'll just leave it go for a minute. Yeah. And uh, we'll see what we are in a second. But we're on the edges of quite a few of these upwellings, even with the sprickles. So 
Whereas back there it was pure sprinkles everywhere, there was no upwellings and we hit 11 knots, but no, we're holding a nice steady 9.6 and there's a little whirlpool just forming there. Yeah. So it's that kind of day in the Doris Moor. This is not Doris Moor. Oh, this give over. This is Sound of Jura. Well, whatever, Sound of Jura, bottom of the Sound of Lings. Look, Doris Moor's there, Corrie Brecken's there, Jura's there, Sound of Lings there. We're in the middle of it all. Yeah. We're 10.2, by the way. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, so 10.3, 10.4, 10.5, it's going up, can't you tell? 10.1. We're riding the rocket. Well, Bev and I came to Craig House yesterday um, and uh, with it being a Sunday, Craig House uh, is uh, closed. Uh, so Bev and I went out on the um, dinghy uh, because we're actually on a mooring ball, uh, but we wanted to have a look at the anchorage. Um, and there are areas, because it was so clear that you could actually see the sand, but mainly it is like a kelp forest and there was one ca um, uh, level of seaweed, don't know what it was, but it was such a vibrant green, it was amazing. Um, but um, what we're worried about, uh, particularly on this mooring ball now, is we're at high tide and um, it's swinging quite low because we're bouncing like a cork. And I've already seen 0 0.8 on there. So regardless of what's going to happen, we are going to have to move off this mooring ball. But we're waiting for the weather forecast to see whether we're moving and not seeing Jura, which I had wanted to uh, have a look at. Um, but we're waiting for the weather and we'll find out what the heck we're going to do because it's one of those days. It's been the curse of our Hebridean journey, hasn't it? The easterly wind. Yes, um, you know, there's not much shelter from Easts because where we were, obviously, at um, the Fairy Isles, that is um, shelter from the East. But that means that you'd be punching into the wind to go back there. So, oh, it's just... Ugh. All these things you've got to think about. That was a bit of madness, wasn't it, Beth? Well, it didn't look that bad from in here, but the problem that we have, I think, around the entrance here is that the Sound of Jura, close to the island, is about 40 or 50 metres deep. And then it comes up to three metres deep, just at the entrance. And um, I think it just piles up. There was horrible, horrible seas on the way in there. Uh, we weren't really making progress, and we were getting tossed from side to side. And I just decided, I don't care if it's got poor holding, the, the one boat I can see in the anchorage is sitting lovely and serene and not getting kicked about and it's in deeper water than what we were over there. We had about a metre under the keel and we had a falling tide of about a metre to go, which is not good. Here we've got four metres under the keel and yeah. a falling tide of a metre to go, so we'll have three under when we're done. Yeah, but the other thing is where we were, because it was fine when it was flat calm, as soon as you've got um, waves... Soon, as soon as you've got like metre, metre and a half peaks and troughs, then you lose that depth. Exactly, because we got to 0.8 that I was saw. Here we've got an island directly in front of us with a reasonable amount of height on it, and we're sitting in its wind shadow as best we can. The holding in this part of the island is meant to be poor, but I'll take it any day over sitting in those balls getting hammered. If it just lasts for six hours until the wind calms, and then we can go and pick a deeper ball or something, we'll take it. Well, you can tell we had a bit of a rolly night when uh, the lee sheets are out 
Um, but um, just because of the way the tides worked, um, when we had a north going tide, uh, it was very rolly, but when we had a south going tide, it was calmer. Still had roll at the um, 3 twelfths part of the tide, but uh, we could live sleep through it, that was all that mattered. <sighs> Well, I had hoped to explore Craig House today, uh, but there's a weather system coming in, um, and um, which means that today is clear, uh, but um, tomorrow um, there's going to be strong winds and stuff. Now, it's a bit of a dodgy place to go, but we've decided to have one last hurrah. So we're going to go over to Isle before we're calling it quits on the season. Um, but um, although I do like anchoring, it's clear to us that um, we've got to anchor in June, July, August because this is September and we've just had clag, 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 clag. Well, and for those who don't know, clag is solid cloud cover. Yeah, <laughs> solid cloud cover. With no sunlight. No sunlight at and all. And therefore very little light put from the solar panels. Yeah, and um, whereas at least in Port Ellen, we will be able to um, be attached to the electric point. So we'll probably do uh, some work while we're there. And uh, just um, hopefully get to a distillery. <laughs> I suspect it'll be closed by now, but never mind. To be fair to the solar panels, it's been a week of solid clag. Yes, it has. And but they've done their best with it, but it's, you know, we're, we're not really hurting yet, but we need to go. The season's over up here. It is, unfortunately, and it's just the way it is. Well, we've arrived in Port Ellen and it was a bit of a bumpy passage. We had um, a fair amount of ocean swell and things like that, but um, it was nice enough. The weather was nice, but what was eye-catching was the big breakers we could see off to starboard as they went over the rocks and shoals uh, just off the south coast of Isle. Um, they were quite spectacular, so I hope we've we'll been able to capture that for the video. Um, we're in now, but as usual, the forecast has not lived up to its promise and we have gone starboard to a finger because the wind was supposed to be coming from our starboard side. But now that we're here, the wind is coming from our port side. So I'm going to get my coffee down and then it's um, back outside and we're going to move the boat. Yeah, um, I actually, uh, I know I should know this already, but uh, we saw these beautiful breakers and I actually saw the the correct sign on the uh on the chart and i now know what that means it's more than i do right coffee time then off we go Away, then. Yeah, so what's going on, Gainer? Oh. Why have you moved the boat 10 feet? Well, there's going to be a storm blowing and um, 
we looked at the position of the boat and uh, where the winds are coming from and um, the winds are going to be coming on our beam from, so from this side from that side <laughs> from behind me basically so uh, we've decided that we'd rather be pushed off the pontoon than pushed onto the pontoon um, so we moved the boat but there was a hazard <laughs> that we had not yet thought of <laughs> And that is that my Ellie hat <laughs> and I was sweating her in and I was like, I can't see anything. <laughs> oh days. Ellie just wanted to be in and on the action. Yeah, but the boat's in now, that's the important thing. Oh absolutely. And uh, one of the things that we didn't do last time. We didn't actually go on a distillery tour, so I'm gonna we're gonna go off this afternoon and we're gonna see if there's actually any distilleries open to do tours because it is late in the season. It's very late in the season, yes. So, so the visitor season may be over for the distilleries. But we'll have a go, you know us. We'll we asked the wee man in the um office, the, the, the harbour master. Yeah. He might know. Okay, fair enough. But we're gonna go for a walk, but that'll be after lunch. <laughs> 